So welcome to uh, Ken Miller's Counseling and Psychotherapy Programs Information Night. Uh, it's good to see we've got a few people here. Hopefully, oh, I think some of you I've even met before. That, that's a good sign. Um, all right, before we, before we get started, I would like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners uh, or traditional custodians of country uh, throughout Australia from wherever it is you're dialing in from. Uh, specifically though, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation who are the traditional custodians of country where Ken Miller resides. And I'm speaking from uh, Bunwarung uh, country, which is Bayside, uh, Victoria. I'm talking to you from Mentone. Uh, if you happen to know, um, whose uh, land you're on, uh, do feel free to um, introduce yourself and uh, put it in the chat. Um, uh, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, presents and emerging, and um, also would like to welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander um, peoples who are with us here today. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Zohar and turns out I can't read with my glasses on, so I'll, um, I'll take them off. Um, my name is Zohar. I'm the course coordinator for the counselling and psychotherapy uh, programs at Ken Miller Institute. I take care of the postgraduate programs. Um, I'm a counsellor and psychotherapist. I've been um, a practitioner for almost 20 years and I've been teaching for nearly as long as that. Um, so um, that's me, and I'll be talking to you tonight a little bit about our program. Tonight, uh, or this, this evening, I'm hoping to uh, let you know a little bit about Ken Miller Institute, a little bit about our counselling and psychotherapy program, a little bit about uh, the placement um, component of the counselling and psychotherapy program. We've got, um, we've got uh, Anne and Claudia here who are um, very vital members of our team who can add, who can talk to you a little bit about the applications process and uh, administration side of things. And hopefully we'll get a chance to answer you, some of your questions by going through that process. And you, if you have any questions left at the end, we'll also be happy to answer any of those. So uh, who are we? Well, we're a not-for-profit uh, and we've been... Um, looking after um, people's mental health for the last 60 years. Uh, we, we offer high quality education and accessible mental health services, which means we are both a clinic and a uh, place that teaches um, counseling, psychotherapy, psychology, and uh, related uh, courses. Um, and so we do um, look after both education and uh, actually outreach into the community, which is probably one of the things or one of the many things that make us uh, unique. We also pioneered counselling and psychotherapy in Australia. So uh, Dr. Frances McNabb, who was the founder of Ken Miller Institute, uh, was um, really um, instrumental in introducing counselling and psychotherapy uh, to Australia 60 years ago. So um, some advantages of studying with us is that we're um, um, an accreditation. Oh, sorry, I'm having something going on with my hearing. Um, low cost um, additional accredited training and professional development. So we have short courses that we offer that, um, that uh, you would have access to uh, at a good uh, fees. Uh, we have academic uh, writing skills support. Um, lecturers have an open door policy and we have small class sizes. What does this mean? Uh, well, what we're saying is we're boutique and being boutique uh, makes it a personal experience. Uh, you get a more personal touch in terms of um, you're not just a number. Uh, the, the training is rich, experiential and practical. So it's hands on learning with somebody who knows who you are, who um, can inter, you know, you, you've got small classes and um, I mean, the, the downside of that is that uh, there are only limited places available, but the upside of that is that generally speaking, if you're 
suitable enough for the profession and you're in the right place in your personal development as a person, uh, then, uh, you know, you'll, you'll be among peers and you get the value of having a supportive environment, both from students and from uh, your lecturers. And we're accredited um, and endorsed by peak bodies in counselling and psychotherapy. So that's uh, PACFA and the ACA. And we've got an outstanding reputation for quality. We're in the uh, top six, I think, or top five uh, institutions uh, in terms of student outcomes uh, in Australia, um, at least from the ones that, oh, it, that, that got surveyed nationally in terms of student outcomes uh, for our uh, particular um, area of expertise. So um, I could probably talk more about that data, uh, but I think I will stay focused on the program itself for today. Um, what else can I tell you? We're, we're taught by people who know what they're doing. And when I say we, I mean you. you. You would be taught by people who know what they're doing. And what I mean by this is that a lot of universities have uh, put a really big emphasis on um, a lot of things like uh, number crunching and, um, and a really big emphasis on uh, number of publications and things like that. And what that has done is... Uh, created a situation where a lot of counselling programs are not run by practitioners and not run by counsellors. Um, so one of the things that really make our training um, uh, kind of robust is that you're taught by people who are also professionals in the field and who have been, uh, you know, are senior professionals in the field. Um, these are some of our lecturers um, and um, yeah, you, you can put a face to a name and you know, by the end of the program, you would know them quite well. Um, in terms of our actual program, uh, our overall aim is to support you in developing the qualities, attributes and skills or what we refer to as a way of being uh, that will set you on a path uh, to becoming an effective, reflexive and morally competent practitioner. So I guess where you know, our philosophy is that, you know, you cannot just learn a shopping list of things and then go off and be a therapist. You actually need to uh, be able to learn how to think like a therapist and where to draw your resources from and know how to integrate the information that you're being exposed to in a way that sets you on the right path to then forever keep developing as a therapist. So you do get a very solid foundation. Um, our, uh, we're, we're philosophically aligned, which means we don't just grab bits and pieces from a whole bunch of different things. Uh, everything that you're taught, you're taught to build on. Um, it's, it's also referred to as constructively aligned. You, everything that you're taught builds on the previous skills that we teach you. So you uh, slowly go and deepen your work and it all works to a integrated and integrative humanistic process oriented approach. These are all big words for people who um, aren't familiar with uh, these, um, these terms, but what they mean from our perspective, humanistic me is, is, you know, it's a whole philosophy, which I'm not going to try to describe in the next five minutes, but what I will say about it that's relevant is we come from the assumption that who you are as a person uh, is very much what you bring to being a um, therapist and that we come from an assumption that uh, every person has within them um, a tendency towards self-realization and our job as therapists is to support the right, uh, provide the right supports, environments, nutrition for a person to access uh, what they know to be true and to support them in finding a way uh, forward. So we don't come from a perspective that medicalizes and pathologizes people, even though we do learn a little bit about that, just so you um, have the tools to communicate with other uh, allied health professionals and other mental health professionals who are not um, philosophically aligned with us. Uh, being process orientated, me, it, 
for those of you who are in corporate environments, process means something very different. So we're not talking about following procedures. Process orientation means that uh, there is something within us that when accessed, it, it unfolds in real time and we can work with what emerges in the moment to um, develop fresh perspectives. And so what that means from our training perspective is that you'll be put through experiences, conversations, uh, and encouraged to uh, reflect on those experiences and uh, glean some of your own insights from what um, emerges in those processes. And, and so that's what we mean by process orientation. It also doesn't fully capture what it needs to capture in order to make that um, that phrase real, but um, at least it gives you a little bit of a um, direction of what we're talking about. Our program may, however, not be for you. So what I guess I want to highlight some things that uh, maybe make some people not suitable uh, or it might not be a suitable time for them to study with us. Um, and, and one of those things is that uh, the program draws on transformative learning practices. It, it's immersive, it's experiential, it's reflexive, it's interpersonal and it's process orientated. Have described the process orientated a little bit. Um, immersive kind of means that you kind of need to be in a place in your life where you're ready to dive in and really live it for a little while and really explore it and experience it and think about things. And also it's interpersonal. I'll, I'll speak to that um, in a, a little bit more uh, as we progress. So um, it, the, the idea of it being contemplative and reflective is, is the notion that, um, you know, you're going to be encouraged to reflect on things like, why on earth would you want to do something so crazy as to be busy with somebody else's problems? Why would you want to do that? Well, we, we, we don't want to discourage you from wanting to do that, but we want you to be curious about what is it in your life? What is it in your family of origin? What is it that you get out of this? How much of this is a choice and how much of this were you, um, has it been just um, something you've done automatically your whole life and you're looking for a place for that, you know, and none of that's wrong. This is the thing. We're not looking for right or wrong answers. It's not that if you discover something about yourself that makes you not suitable. Uh, on the contrary, uh, we, we want to be in this forever process of really learning more about ourselves because the more we are familiar with our own stuff, the better we are at holding space and looking after others. So that's something we want to encourage uh in um in our practitioners so um you know parts of the course will be encouraging you to self-reflect if you're in a place where you're in in to rescue everybody else but not willing to look at yourself it's not going to be the right program for you okay um there's a relational emphasis so all our wounds not all our wounds but a lot of our wounds uh, other than nat natural disasters maybe uh the, the rest of our traumas tend to have formed in relationship so it's in relationship that we develop our trust in others in ourselves um and and, and any barriers we're going to have to that are going to be emerging interpersonally and it's interpersonally that we can become aware of these things and work to shift those things or uh, heal, heal some of our pains. Our work with clients is very relational and our work with each other will, will be relational. Uh, a lot of times, you know, if you've, if you've had uh, bullying experiences at school, you know, you might find yourself feeling more anxious having to interact with other students. Um, again, that's not something I want to say that, you know, if you've been bullied at school and that makes you anxious, don't come to our courses. On the contrary, um, it might be the place for you to um, re rewire around these things, but but it is an environment in which you, you know, where how you what happens for you, what emerges for you in relation to another person who rubs you the wrong way, all of that needs to be taken back to self reflection. Well, what what can I learn about myself here? Where is this touching on something on an old pain of mine? You know, what belongs here and what belongs in the past? You know. All of that would be part of your learning, not just what you read about. So again, you need to be ready for that. 
it's reflexive. So reflexive means a lot of things, but in this context, what we're meaning is um, if we, um, we're not only thinking about what's happening for us, we're thinking about what is it about that and how is it that, you know, we, we want to keep looking at our own processes. It's not just, um, it's not just about noticing what happens for me, it's noticing what's happening for me. And then also looking at my motivations around that and looking at my assumptions around that and cr critically questioning, uh, you know, where does this, um, you know, what, where, like what values do these, does this come from? What values do I hold that inform this and, and things like that. So it's kind of unpacking a little bit what goes on for you around things. And, the pedagogy, so the, the way we teach is this kind of combination of theory, practice and personal work in any which order and each of them inform each other. So, um, so it's very experiential, it's very hands-on. And, and, um, and uh, before I go to this one, one of the reasons I kind of emphasise the process orientation is that a lot of times a counselling relationship will unfold in very unpredictable ways. So part of the learning in a course like this is learning to notice what happens for you when you don't know where something's going and let, you know, when something, learning to be comfortable with things developing organically. So if you need like really rigid structures around things, you might struggle in this course uh, because if that's where you find your safety and knowing where everything's going, there are times where we offer that and there are times where we go, no, well, let's see what happens. Let's see where this goes. You're just getting general idea of what's going to be covered, but it'll also be tied in with what you bring and how we engage with each other. So these are all the kind of experiential process orientated stuff. And then essentially a lot of what the way we teach mimics what happens in a counselling relationship. So you want to keep tying that back in your mind. Well, how does this reflect what happens in a counselling relationship? That might be helpful for me to know. So the, that means that this style of learning can be uh, difficult because it requires emotional and psychological readiness. Like if you have just in the middle of a huge crisis in your life, it might not be the right time. It doesn't mean you're not suitable forever, but it might not be the right time. Uh, you want to have some degree of clarity about why you want to do this. Uh, you need to have openness to experience. Um, and, and so if you're very, very concrete and everything needs to be just so, it'll be more difficult for you to do a course like this. Um, you need to be curious about what you don't know about yourself. Uh, you need the maturity to handle what you discover when you discover things about yourself. Uh, and, and be able to learn from that experience rather than become super defensive about it or pick fights with people or, or you know, whatever people do in order to avoid the vulnerability of, oh, I'm, I'm learning something about myself that maybe hurts me. This doesn't mean that we're going to be uh, poking hot rods at you and publicly shaming you or anything like that. You haven't joined a cult. It's just, um, it's, it is a, a gentle process but it's still a process that is quite evocative. Um, and you need to have the capacity to emotionally self-regulate to some degree. So, um, you know, so if you kind of get overwhelmed and have massive meltdowns because, you know, it, whenever there's a small struggle, it, it, you know, a lot of us have those issues, you know, you need to have done some work with that and come to a point where you already know how to manage yourself well enough and, and to be able to stay on track with your studies when things stir you up because more than in uh, courses where you just learn stuff, because you're learning stuff and tying it into yourself, you, you're constantly having these pennies drop about your parents, about your siblings, about your relationships, about all of these things. And that takes up a lot of mental space. So you need to be able to stay on track with studying when stuff emerges. So also when you're considering if you want to sign up full-time or part-time, consider that things take longer than you might give them credit for because you're processing so much stuff about yourself. Um, into, I might also just flag with uh, Claudia or Anne to give me a prompters if I over talk and, 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 and miss the runway because um, I'm not keeping track at this point in time. <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of um, programs and the enrollment structure, I'll leave the enrollment structure to, um, to Claudia and Anne after, but just about the program itself. So we're a nested suite, a nested suite. What the 
does this mean? Okay, well, we've got a graduate certificate, we've got a graduate diploma and a master's. Each of them lives within the other. So a master's degree is a, is a two year program. A graduate certificate is the first section of that. The graduate diploma is the first two section of that. Yeah, I'll actually show you the slide, might, might make it easier to follow. Um, all right, so a full-time graduate diploma is the first year of the master's. Uh, yeah, full-time graduate diploma is the first year of the master's. Um, and so if you were studying a full-time graduate diploma, it would be one full year of study. If you were doing it part-time, it would be two years of study. And what you are studying uh, in the uh, graduate diploma are these subjects here. This is being recorded, so you can revisit this later if you want to have a, another look at it. Um, and you'll see that uh, there's a counselling placement as part of the graduate diploma. So if you were studying part time, you'd be doing these units first, you'd be doing uh, so um, if you're doing full time, you're doing four units in one semester. If you're doing part time, you're doing two units in part uh, in the first semester. Yeah, so if you were doing part time, you'd be doing these two units in semester one, these two units in semester two, and then you do the following um, those two and those two uh, in the second one, or you do the four at once uh, and then or the eight over the year. Uh, so that would be the first year of the um, master's is the graduate diploma. Uh, and then so if this is the first if the if the graduate diploma is the first year of the master's, the second year of the master's is um, are these units. Um, and they can be taught in in various orders, but these are, these are some of the subjects you'd be studying there. So the idea is you could be enrolled uh, in the master's uh, full time, two years, part time over four years, um, or you can be enrolled in the graduate diploma uh, and then apply to continue to the master's. Um, there are different entry requirements for each. For the master's, you need a uh, minimum average of 70% um, and be um, considered suitable uh, for the master's program. Um, and same with the graduate diploma, it's it's a 60% to get into the uh, graduate diploma and you need to be considered suitable uh, for that as well. Um, suitable and ready, it's not just about suitable. Um, we've also got, um, a, a, one thing I didn't show you is that you see there's another counselling placement in the in the master's. So if you're doing a master's degree, there'll be two counselling placements. Um, one of the things that are, uh, I guess, also unique to us is that, or not unique, but it's very rare now that uh, placement organisation, that counselling courses arrange placements for students. We do. So that's another one of the, uh, I guess, um, added values of being in a small boutique organisation is that we have existing and ever growing uh, relationships with a variety of placement organisations and we uh, arrange these for you. And, and the, the purpose of the placement is, um, there's, it has a lot of reasons which I'll talk about, but one of them is, um, to meet the requirements of the Counseling and Psychotherapy Federation of Australia and the Australian Counseling Association, which are the two peak bodies, uh, which um, we are also accredited with. Uh, you can be a member of these if you have completed a certain amount of study and if you have got, if you get regular supervision and after a certain amount of, uh, after you, what the level that you are a member depends on the amount of uh, clients you've counselled uh, and the amount of supervision you've received. That is different to the accreditation we have from these bodies. These bo Our accreditation just essentially says that they've scrutinised us and are willing to endorse our programs. Um, and then you, your membership is its own thing that you would apply for with them but it's much easier to apply for membership with them if they think you've um, 
you've done a good program uh, and you, 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 there's less onus on you to prove that you're well educated if you've gone to a course that has uh, been through their accreditation process. Uh, the aims of placement are to gain experience with a wide, with a wide range of clients. Uh, it gives you opportunities to uh, apply your learning in a real context, learn about uh, professional conduct in the field, uh, and that's an expectation of you is to behave professionally in, in, on a placement, uh, to learn about um, real world challenges, uh, benefit from the experience of frontline workers, develop a range of professional skills necessary for collaborative teamwork, um, and, and develop an awareness of uh, and ability to navigate some of the resources and challenges in uh, mental health care in Australia. You, we also provide in-house supervision and that supervision, uh, which is in addition to everything you get from your placement and all the experience and knowledge and insight you get from interacting with people on placement and from being helpful on your placement, um, it, is that we have supervisors who can support you to uh, case conceptualise and apply your the, it becomes an extension of the learning. So we teach you different approaches and then they help you apply those approaches to your clients and make sense of your world. So supervision is a real support, both in your training and later in, in life. Um, these are key, place, key aspects of placement. So how um, placements develop. Uh, we have a placement coordinator and They'll meet with the student, discuss your prior experience and preferences, um, source a potential placement for you. Um, uh, you'll, still, you, you'll still need to apply for that placement like you would apply for a job, but they will put you forward. Um, and then they'll assist you with the preparation for that. Um, and that their aim is to seek to match a student with an appropriate placement based on what they know the placement uh, requirements are. Um, and assist the student to prepare for that. And then the student needs to learn about the placement organisation's relevant policies, assist with everyday related tasks of the agency in a professional manner, um, and uh, provide a minimum of 40 hours of counselling to real clients uh, and keep records and case notes and write reports. Um, and then, yeah, you you get support around how to do all of that, both in your training and in um in your regular supervision um, and then we placed students in a variety of settings so uh, community agencies and clinics uh, healthcare you know health centers schools universities and tertiary institutions aged care facilities uh, EAP counseling um, and we also have um, opportunities within rural settings uh, so that's like an incredible opportunity but I know not everyone can um, afford the time to I don't know drive down to the Latrobe Valley and, Valley and spend a night there but uh, we provide overnight accommod paid overnight accommodation for students who are interested in rural placements they are uh, probably some of the most valuable placements that um, that uh, opportunities people have because it's so desperately needed so you're making a big difference out in the world it's really important to recognize that placement organizations it's it's a financial um, it's a financial and resource burden for them to take on uh, clients uh, to take on um, placement students on placement and they do so willingly uh, but that there's an exchange in that so part of that exchange is that you need to be helpful and you need to be professional and you need to add value to their team and they will offer you support and exposure and uh, understanding of how the world works. And they assume you're a student, so they don't expect you to know how to do everything either. So um, are there any questions about any of this so far? Zoha, um, after completing the masters, um, can students wear the, both titles, the counsellor and psychotherapist? Um, yes and no. Um, you can use those titles because they're not regulated. Uh, you can, uh, in terms of, uh, if you to be to be considered a fully fledged psychotherapist, you need more than two years of training. So it sets you on a pathway to psychotherapist. You're legally allowed to still call yourself a psychotherapist, um, but. 
uh, to be a member of the College of Psychotherapists. So PACFA and ACA, they have like sub membership organizations uh, and, and to belong to those, you would need further training. You'd probably need another couple of years of training in a particular, um, you get exposed to enough and, and given enough of a uh, fundamental uh, underpinning and then you would need to further develop in a direction that is of interest to you to be a member of, it's like being a member of a guild in a way. Um, uh, so that's kind of extra kudos, but you could uh, already call, you know, you could already use both uh, terms. Thank you. Yep. And um, what would you comment on someone wanting to do one unit per semester to handle um, work outside of study? Uh, yeah, well, I, I would probably, uh, I'd probably discourage one unit per semester. We do have provisions for it, but it would mean that things would take you a very long time because the first year of, I guess what you would want to consider, okay, a couple of things, sorry. The first thing I would say is that it, it would depend on how many places we have available because we'd probably prioritise uh, students who can do part, like a regular part-time and a uh, full-time. That would be the first thing. But let's say we have room. Uh, let's say we, we, were able, we thought, yep, you are a great candidate. Uh, we can afford the space. We can afford to, to give you that, um, that extra seat because we think and, and we want to invest in you. We want to invest our time and love in you, which we do for all our students. Uh, so you've convinced us of that. Um, what what would the, the problem is the it's possible, but the the first year units need to be studied in a particular order. So if you do one, you'll find yourself having a big gap and then having to wait, you know, wait wait a few months and then come back and doing another single one. It would it would kind of not, they're, they're not so mix and matchable for the first year. The second year, easy. Second year, you could do that. Or third year, sorry, if you were, yep. Pete, is My question is just about um, when classes are held. Like, let's say um, I anticipated doing it um, part-time or full-time. Is it during the evenings or during the day? Um, I'm just trying to work out my existing work arrangements with the possibilities here, and um, and I'm yeah. assuming, and assuming we actually attend the campus in East Hawthorne. Yeah, that's correct. So that, that they're great questions. Thank you for asking them. So um, we 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 aim for the part time units to be on the same day. So uh, yes, they are on campus. That and essentially you would have three hours face to face um, for each unit. And you can expect another nine or so hours of work beyond that not, uh, three hours face-to-face -face per week. So it's about 12 hours a week of your time per unit. Um, and then so we, yeah, so the first units are, the first two units are taught on Tuesday. So it'd be nine till, nine till 12 and then one till four on a Tuesday. Uh, the second units uh, are on a, a Thursday. So if you're doing full time, you'd be doing a full day on Tuesday and a full day on Thursday. And if you were doing part time, you would only be doing a full day on Tuesday. Have I got that correct, Claudia, or am I making stuff up? Good question. I don't have the timetable okay. in front of me, um, but if you're happy for me to distribute that information when we send out the recording, um, then I can do that as well. Yep, happy. Yep, happy for you yep. to do that. But yeah, the Thanks. first units, the first units would be um, person uh, theories and person centered counselling there on a Tuesday. Um, so if you were doing part time, that would be your day from nine till four. Um, and then, yeah, so, you would, yep. So, Zoha, can I confirm something quickly? Um, uh, um, you mentioned that in terms of the workload, it's three hours of face to face uh, per unit per week. Yes. And then in addition, it's an additional nine, year, nine hours? Or is the... Approximately, it depends. There's, there's a lot that you've got. You've got readings to do in between <laughs> classes. You've got assignments to prepare. You've got, um, for certain units, you're encouraged to practice in between classes to get the full value out of the unit. Uh, practice with your peers. Uh, 
And so between all of those things, it averages on about nine additional hours in addition to the face-to-face -face per week. Yeah. Doesn't mean that it's that much every week. Some weeks are busier than others. Um, and it also depends how long it takes you to read things and um, how long, how quickly it is for you to get your head around an assignment. Um, but yeah, it is, for anyone who's studying full time, it really is full time. So when we have people going, oh, you know, can I keep my four day a week, a three day a week job and study full time? Mm -hmm. Why would you want to do that to yourself? Like that's, that's uh, a, a fast track to getting run down. Um, but so if you can afford to do full time study that, I mean, afford the time to do full time study, that's great. Um, otherwise, um, part time part times I think are really good uh, a good option as well it just depends on your circumstances yeah uh, I was just going to and is it it's two semesters per per year from what I understand two, two semesters per year that's correct yeah sure thank you Zoha um we might just move on can you just touch on um this question can I expect to be able to work in community settings and within business settings not solely working with individuals families couples or schools I think I, I, that might be in relation to placement. If the person who posted that question wants to clarify um, while we move on, but do you understand that question? I don't, no. That's okay. Um, we'll just get them to clarify. And is placement paid or unpaid? Placement is unpaid. Yes. Um, sorry, can you hear me? It's Luke. I, I'm the one who put that question up about the... Um, question around community settings. I suppose what I'm trying to articulate and probably haven't done it well That's is right. um, I'm, a, I'm certainly interested in, uh, you know, individual therapy, in couples, family. I'm also wondering about the opportunities to say work in community groups where it might be football clubs or it might be in business settings that are interested in having somebody come in and lead a session in X, Y or Z uh, that where you could bring your skills to bear in that type of environment. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's just a wondering that I've got. Um, EAP counselling is in a business setting, uh, but what you're talking about is a little bit different. Uh, we don't currently have uh, any placement set up for, for those kind of uh, contexts. However, those may very well be really good directions for you to set up your practice in uh, yeah. later. And um, certainly when you're in your master's year, if you're already working in those kind of environments, you can use what you learn in your master's year, like in the second year to yeah. enhance those skills. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we might just answer Eva's question verbally, sure. and then we'll have to move on to the application process. Okay. No worries. Thanks, Claudia. You're just on mute, Eva. Sorry. Um, thanks. Um, you might have mentioned it. Um, did you mention how many hours the um, placement is? No, I didn't. And that's such a good question. Thank you for uh, pulling me up on not mentioning that. I really appreciate okay. that. So, um, so placement, uh, placement is either full day or two days uh, a week. Uh, most placement organizations prefer you give them two days a week and they prefer you stay for a longer period like than the start of semester start to the end of semester they want you to start a bit earlier and complete a bit later for client continuity um, so a lot of it depends on the combination between your availability and their needs but if you do have availability for two days uh, it it makes you of greater value to the placement organization I mean, one of the things is that most community agencies are really badly under-resourced. So part of the reason they they want to have on, take on placement um, uh, students is that there's an opportunity for an exchange where you can learn from them and in return, they're sharing their client load with you. So um, that's kind of the give and take of a placement organisation. And yeah, that wasn't your question. That was a question before, but anyway, yep. I was just wondering how many hours it would be in total. Yeah, it, the place it, any, is a hundred hours or what is it overall? Um, it it just varies from placement to placement, and I agree that that needs to be tidied up. We have a minimum minimum forty hours of face to face counselling in a placement, but you're expect for, 
per placement. So yeah. over the master's degree, that's 80 hours, but you're expected to provide more hours than just the face-to-face. -face. Um, so that's part of the negotiation of the placement and the placement coordinator can um, part of, you know, depending on your availability also work it out with you. But mm -hmm. we've had students that, uh, we've had students that after they've met their 40 hours of client hours, and if they've done that halfway through the semester, they, they're they happy to leave the placement early because they've met their requirements. That's bad form. Like the placement organisations relying on you and, ha and have made their planning in relation to you being contracted to be with them for a particular amount of time. So, um, yeah, so you, you do give more hours than the uh, 40 face-to-face -face hours and sometimes you'll get a lot more face-to-face -face hours than 40 as well and sometimes you just scrape through the 40 in the time frame you've got so yeah. mm -hmm. could be like I don't know like in in other in other uh, places that I've worked it's been about like 150 hours placement placements were 150 hours for those 40 hours of face-to-face -face. we don't define that so clearly we just go you need you're going to have the 40 hours face to face you're going to have um you're going to have at least 10 hours if not more of supervision um and then you need time for client notes you need time to for inductions and orientations and other stuff and then yeah sometimes you can help them with um with a health promotion project or something that's going on in the agency so uh, there are opportunities for uh, to offer more there and how long exactly beyond those 40 hours um, is something to be spoken about with the placement coordinator and your uh, your availability and and what the agency need of you yeah. thanks Zoha. thank you we might we might move on to the application process quickly and then we'll come back to questions <coughs> after that so just hold on to your questions for now and Zohar, if you can navigate the slides, please, for Anne. Oh, yes, sorry. All good. <laughs> so got a, I forgot I'm going with the slides. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, everyone. Oh, excuse me. Uh, welcome to tonight's session. My name is Anne, and I'm the Deputy Academic Registrar here at Carl Miller. Um, and my colleague, Claudia, here is from the Student Admin 2 team as well, and she's our Senior Administrator. So we'll get started. I always start these off by saying now you've reached the fun stuff. This is the good stuff. Um, so applications are open at the moment and they opened in August and they will close very shortly, which is on the 31st of October. So you, if you are keen on applying, um, please take note of that date. Uh, we anticipate in early November applications will start to be reviewed and subsequently interviews will then um, be organised and you will receive um, an invite by your email um, notifying you and inviting you um, to book a time and date. Orientation is scheduled for February. Um, Classes start on the 20th of February. So it's usually, excuse me, be about two weeks before the 20th. And that's to be confirmed, but it's compulsory. Your attendance, it, it is compulsory. Thanks, Soha. Now, in terms of how to apply, um, if you jump onto our website, um, basically, uh, Claudia, if you can shoot through our website in the chat. Um, basically, you can apply. It's it, it's really not that difficult. It's if you use the apply now button um, and press on that. But before you do that, I certainly encourage you to have a good read of the course and its admissions requirements, um, which we're going to go through. But just so you, so you know what is required as a part of that application process. Thanks, Soha. So this is our portal. By pressing the Apply Now button, it will take you here. If you have not applied at Carnmiller before, um, you will need to register, create an account, 
However, if you have applied previously, all you'll need to do is um, press the log in button. However, if you have previously applied and you've used a, a different email account, um, that's kind of one of our, um, our criteria that we look at. And in that case, you would probably have to register and create another account. Thank you, Zoha. Now, once you've applied, um, like I said, we will start looking at applications once they're closed and from early November. And from early November, you'll be able to track your application status um, as we review and screen and so forth. And you can do that by the student dashboard. And it's just a matter of logging back into the portal um, after you've applied. Thank you, Zoha. All right, now the fun stuff. I think Zoha did touch on this. Um, the grad cert and the grad dip, there are slightly different um, requirements or entrance requirements per se. So, um, of course, you'll need an undergrad degree um, related in a discipline with a 60% average. And obviously there's a um, short question and answer component that you also need to complete. And then if you are invited to an interview that um, having done your undergrad in a related discipline, you would be considered for the grad dip. Um, or a bachelor degree in any discipline with at least 60% average, Work experience, life experience will certainly um, be taken into consideration. And we would certainly also encourage you to take on, if you were offered the grad cert, for example, um, you have a degree in any discipline, um, that's what we, we, we would consider you for. Um, we would certainly encourage you to undertake the um, counselling skills short course which is running um, next week. And I'm going to also do the foundation um, course next week. So I'm very excited about that. Uh -huh. I've heard very good things about it. For, for you to be considered into the Masters of Counselling, again, as Zoha did um, explain, it is a nested program. It is a part of the nested suite. Um, again bachelor degree in a related discipline, successful interview, and please take note of those short answer, short question and answers. They're a part of the application form. So we really try to make it as simple as we can. But we actually, um, for those who may be wondering, we actually do really read them. Our course coordinators actually do um, yeah. Yep. Take that. <laughs> we do. Yes, and so I will confirm that. Thank you. Um, next, please. Okay. Now, one thing I always, always say that when you are applying, do um, submit a complete application. If you don't, that will cause delays and we will then chase you for those documents. Um, but that basically means Zoha will not look at that application until it is complete. So the requirement... Oops, sorry. Oh, clicky. Thank you. <laughs> so what you need to submit, is that my cue to hurry up? No, um, no, I leaned on it by mistake. So okay. I'm clumsy like that. <laughs> So what you need to submit with your application is your most recent academic transcripts, your CV. We need proof of your identity and citizenship. Please don't submit your licence. Um, we will, and when we say proof of citizenship, we're referring to a passport um, or your um, birth certificate. And we ask of this because in the event you wish to apply for fee help, only Australian citizens are eligible for that um, loan scheme, which I'll touch on later. 
um, but that's really important. And there are short questions and um, answers that you need to also provide. Now, do I have any international students in the audience? Can you put your hand up? Let me know when you want me to switch the slide. Oh, we've got two oh. international students. Welcome um, to the session. So you will need to provide an IELTS. Um, however, if you've done an undergrad degree, three years or more in Australia, um, that may not be a requirement. So do let us know at the time when you apply and we can certainly get that confirmed for you. And if, for the international mm -hmm. students, if you do have any qualifications that Oh, you've, you're muted, Anne. I think you did that. <laughs> no, I don't have the power. Okay. Um, if you do have international qualifications um, and they are not in English, they will need to be um, translated. And if you are, when you are providing these documents, if you are using copies, they must be certified, but if you're scanning and uploading an original document, um, that's then fine as well. Thanks, Zoha. Another good resource, if you need, um, is our FAQs on the website. It's very comprehensive. Um, if you're ever yeah, if you've got an inquiry and you've got a quick question, um, do check out our FAQs on the website. Thanks, Soha. Okay, now the tuition fees. Now you can find our tuition fees and tuition structure um, on the website. Claudia, could you just pop it in the chat as well? Now, if you're applying for a fee um, help, it's similar to HEX, it's a little bit different and it only applies to Australian citizens um, and basically it is a loan scheme and you are then required to pay that money back once you start working um, and basically the ATO takes it from your salary once you um, earn a certain threshold. I think it might be at $54,000 but check out the fee help um, website if you want more information on the study assist. Also, you've got some private organisations like a bank that you can borrow money, but get independent advice before you do that. And if you do want to pay up, up front, you may do so. And if you're struggling to pay that all in one hit, um, you can certainly be put on a payment plan. And we're certainly open to that as well. Thanks so far. That's uh, when you walk in, our uh, main foyer, I guess. Um, it's, a, it's a very snazzy, pretty um, campus. Uh, and Claudia will send you through the, um, you can have a, at your own leisure, you know, check out the facilities, check out the campus. And um, there's a virtual tour um, video that you can watch as well. Thank you. Just a, a, a one minute warning, Anne. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Facilities and services. Um, look, I think we'll make, because I've only got one minute, um, it is a great campus. It is a friendly campus. It is a community. And um, we'll make these slides available to you um, since we're running out of time. And I just want to say that I've worked at some big providers. I've worked at Monash, RMIT, um, Swinburne, um, and here you're a student number. You're not a student number. We know you by name, and it's a real, real boutique community feel. And um, yeah, it's really great service. So that's it from us. Are there any questions for anyone? I have a whole list of questions I gleaned off that list that I'm happy to answer as well. <laughs> Thanks, Zoha. If we have any questions about the application process, particularly for Anne, if we can answer those first, because I've taken note of, of all of the other questions. And what I'll do is I'll collate those, answer them 
uh, in text and send those out to everyone. So we've got like an FAQ document of all the questions that were asked for today's session, just because we won't be able to get through them all. Uh, so sure. if there are I'm, any- I'm, I'm happy to stay on myself a few minutes longer and answer a few of those if, if you like Claudia as well, if that's helpful, but not I'm not sure. Not a problem. Um, there were a couple that I uh, came across about references. Um, uh, how many references? There's three hands up. Yeah. I don't know if that oh, helps. Okay. Maybe they're for mm. Anne. Okay. I'll... Okay, I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes. That's fine. Ava, was there a question for Anne? Or was that from before? Yeah, I have a question about the application. Um, just in regards to the um, having a bachelor from a, re a relevant discipline, um, I've done a PhD that in like in, in arts, like literature and um, theory that I studied psychoanalysis in. Would that count or? Yes, it would. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Kim, if you wanted to unmute yourself. I, I just have a question regarding um, the short answer questions in the application. Um, I guess in my experience in practitioner roles as opposed to peer roles, it can be a bit of a shot in your own foot if you talk about your personal life or talk about your own experiences of mental illness and so on. Um, would that be a similar case for those questions in the application? No. Um, it depends. It depends on how processed you are with with any uh, questions about mental illness. On the contrary, we, uh, from our perspective, we like we we like our students to have had either a lot of life experience or lived experience. I mean, this is this is the good thing. Uh, Counselling tends to be a later in life second profession for a lot of people, uh, and and the reason for that is because you would have gone through some kind of journey to get to that point. So um, that, that's not something we hold against anybody at all. It's just around where you're at in terms of um, how much work you've done on it, how self-regulated you are and things like that, if that's going to interrupt you uh, interacting in a professional uh, manner or learning at this point in time. But on the contrary, uh, lived experience is very valued and it's growing in in uh, the wider community's appreciation of that as well. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, Arena? We, we might answer a lipping question as oh. they had a question a, a little Anne? while ago. Yep. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I have two questions. First the question, I think uh, counseling is a very personal and emotional subject. And uh, I'm 31 years old and uh, I had been through lots of suffering difficulty in my life. But I know I have lots of other things I need to fix um, to help myself to be a better person. I also look like uh, look like a starting counseling can be a way to help myself to develop her as a an individual person and in a long time I think it's quite meaningful and feels feel like her you know very feel very emotional job and, and I think her for now I don't think I'm very established person I have lots of a difficulty to 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 face to 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 fix myself so I'm not sure whether I'm capable to start at least because I want to to it's through the study to to help myself as well yeah um, I'm happy to answer that question. I, I'm going to just shelve it for a moment. I did write it down just in case there are more questions for Anne. Um, thank you. I, I'm happy to answer that in a few minutes. Oh, I, had, I have a second yes, question. Yes, and the second question. Second question. After I studied four years of tourism management and uh, after that, I, uh, I started a, a, tour, a personal customizer tour company in Shanghai for international travelers, mostly it's one to one, one to one families. And during the, all the experience, uh, constantly helps helped my customer, like individually or personally. But uh, I know tourism is not like a psychology subject, but from personal experience, I do think I observe lots of my customer and help them emotionally to some yep. disagree. It, so whether it's, it's not a related it's not a related field, but it doesn't block you from getting into the program if everything else fits. You just may need to do an additional 
short course with us to bridge um, if you're a good fit and you'd probably only be able to start with the graduate diploma and then see yeah. how you go and, pretend, yeah. and we decide if it's suitable for the master's or not. Yeah, great. Thank you. That's all. Yeah. Jovan, have you got a question for Anne? Uh, yes, just a quick question. <clears throat> I got here very late. I was actually with my psychiatrist having a psychoanalysis. And I guess the question is, one of the big questions about counselling and psychotherapy, these days people can have um, therapy with a psychologist under Medicare, you know, up to 20 sessions a year. Mm -hmm. Why would anyone come to a, a counsellor? Like if I were to study counselling, and psychotherapy, why would anyone come to me rather than see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, which is a lot cheaper? Yeah, well, that's a big question that Anne can't answer, but I've, I've, um, I've, I've uh, written, written it down. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. In terms of myself. Um, sorry, Adrian. Adrian, is that? Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, I've got a background in mental health in community and also um, clinical. I worked at St. Vincent's for a little while. Yeah. But, but um, my qualifications are a cert for community services work and associate diploma in professional writing and editing. But I've worked in mental health for a while and also I've got my own recovery story and I'm writing a book per se at the moment about my memoirs as yeah. well. Yeah. And also I've got a placement already arranged for myself in advance as well. We, well, we, we, we don't just accept other people's placements. We have to, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, something it's... we have to arrange. We have to arrange with the organisation. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, I, I'd also just, um, um, I mean, each each case is going to be its own case, so we're not going to be yeah. able to answer every yeah. person's yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, cool. thing. But um, you know, you could just apply and put your best foot forward, and then yeah. we we choose the best of the bunch to interview, and then we produce the best of that bunch, um, and and then you know each each application is assessed on a case by case basis. So yeah, yeah, um, okay. yeah. So anyone have any questions for Anne? Thank, thanks, Adrian. Could I just let everybody also know, I know you're here um, for the counselling and psychotherapy, um, but for those who may not, after looking at the admissions requirements and feel, you know, you may not qualify, and of course, by all means, you could shoot us an email. Um, we do also now have a Bachelor of psychology and counselling. It's a three-year degree um, and you end up with a dual award. Um, so that's also just letting you all know that's a consideration as well. You apply with free VTAC for that, don't you? Yeah, oh, you've done your research, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. And to apply through VTAC at the moment, you would be deemed as a late application, but applications are certainly open, still open. Until when? Oh, there are various rounds. Um, right. I will pop all the, uh, in the chat, I'll, there's a whole table of VTAC dates. It's so yeah, yeah. confusing. So I'll just shoot it yeah. through and you can have a look at it. I just cool. I, I also had an afterthought about the question before around uh, disclosing uh, mental health uh, concerns. I just also want to say that while we encourage people to disclose and, and be honest about what they you know where they're at and what's driving mm -hmm. their wish to enroll and um, also don't feel pressured to disclose something that doesn't uh, feel okay to disclose as well. you know you need to look after your own. Uh, boundaries and what feels right for you to share and what doesn't um, and so I, yeah I just want to say that as well so I, I don't want there to be a 
impression that there's any kind of pressure that people have to come and disclose their deepest darkest secrets to people who are interviewing them as well just yeah. share as much as feels safe and comfortable to do um, and we don't by default uh we, we don't uh on the principle of someone having mental health concerns discriminate <clears throat> against them for having me mental health concerns it's all a matter of where they're at in their process and if they can manage yeah mm -hmm. Uh, Emma, did you have a question? Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Um, I didn't hear Anne mention anything about the Hodspur reference system. Um, I was under the impression from looking on the website that we also needed two references um, through that system as part of our application. Is that correct? Sorry about that. Um, yes, that is absolutely correct. Um, I think it costs around $25. You need to create an account. Um, make sure what I encourage you all to be consistent with the email accounts you're using in Podspar and what you're using when you're applying to us. So then you would nominate your um, references, referees, sorry, through there and it would get forwarded to them and then it comes back through to us. So um, that's a really good question. My apologies. Oh, no worries. Thanks for that. I just wanted to double check. Yeah, Cheers. No, I'm glad you did. Thank you. I, I want, I'd like to quickly just uh, answer a few of the questions that I jotted down. So um, the first was uh, uh, Lee Ping's question about does it mean that I need to be an established person? We've kind of answered that in other ways as well already, but um, no, the answer is no. And actually, if anyone thinks that they're dealt with their problems and they're fully healed uh, and th there's nothing left to work on, uh, they probably won't get in the door. <laughs> uh, what we want is someone who is self-aware enough to um, have some kind of conscious relationship with what's going on for them. Uh, and, and you know, the rest is a working process. I still see my therapist and I've been a therapist for a long time, so almost 20 years. So uh, no, that's not an expectation, but there is an expectation that you're at a place where you can um, man manage it enough to get through the course comfortably, um, accept uh, feedback without it destroying you and, and things like that when, you know, when we're trying to help you do a, do a better job and grow as a counsellor, because fundamentally we're teaching people to work with vulnerable people and we want to know that when we give you an accreditation that says that you are okay to work with vulnerable people that you're not going to cause harm you know and that and that that doesn't mean you have to be a perfect person we, we work with people training them to maybe accept not being a perfect person is, is a much healthy place healthier place to be than being committed to being perfect all the time um, so that was one question that I saw online. Someone asked, is it in person or online? The majority of the course is in person on campus. Um, in the master's course, there's one unit that is sometimes taught online, which is the uh, family therapy, uh, child and family therapy unit that's sometimes taught online. The rest are on campus unless we're experiencing the plague and um, in which case we all um, hop, on, hop on Zoom. Um, and we also have... We also have a um, hybrid teaching. So if someone happens to have something contagious and is, it's justified, um, then they can um, zoom into the class externally. But we expect full participation from people um, and, and in whatever capacity that is available to you. It doesn't mean that doesn't look the same for each person. It doesn't mean that everyone has to compete for um being loud in a class or anything like that, but just to be present. Um, so um, online is is not a, I didn't feel like getting up this morning, so I'll just log in instead they, because we have small cohorts and there's a group process happening and we affect each other. So it's kind of having that mutual responsibility for how we hold that space for each other. Um, so mostly, mostly in person. Um, that's another one. Um, yeah, related discipline isn't strict, strict, strict. It's a preference. And then when it isn't a related discipline, then if the person's a right fit and it's the right time, then we can do a bridging thing or find a way, uh, find another way forward. Um, 
um, uh, if if someone's um, if someone's already got a, a graduate diploma in a related uh, field that still probably likely have to do the whole uh, program because our second year, because as I said, it's constructively built on each other. So you're learning very specific applied skills in the first, in the graduate diploma that you need in order to survive our, uh, <laughs> successfully negotiate, not survive our uh, master's program. And it's very experiential, it's very interpersonal, it's, it's very different to how it's taught in uh, psychology where things are very cognitively delivered. We look at what happens in the space between people and how we manage those spaces. So you, you could apply for recognition, for advanced standing and have maybe one or two subjects. If you've like, I don't know, if you've got great research behind you, you might be able to skip a research subject or something like that. But um, generally speaking, um, there'll, there'll be key subjects you wouldn't be able to just uh, waver and start it, go straight to second year. Um, someone also asked, uh, uh, what else? Uh, how many assessments per unit? Uh, usually two, uh, sometimes three. If there's a third assessment, one of them is a tiny little assessment just to give you a taster and just to give the teacher an opportunity to help you uh, redirect your skills without it having uh, being high stakes for your mark. Mm -hmm. um, but most assessments are two assessments and they'll, they'll usually, for any of the applied subjects, there'll be a video assessment uh, of you practicing a particular thing that you've been taught. Uh, and there'll usually be some kind of written assessment um, as another assessment, which is usually anywhere between 2,500 to 3,000, 3,500 words. Um, there's some, some units have presentations, some have like presentations in pairs. Um, we mix it up a bit. But yeah, usually about two, two assessments per, per unit. Um, what else have I got on here? Uh, someone asked about the 250 hours for placement. So I kind of answered that before, but essentially 250, that's 125 per placement. Uh, so it's kind of essentially saying that it's, est it's an estimated amount of hours. The 80 hours refers to the face-to-face -face client hours that you need to have over the course of your placement. Whereas the 250 um, over two placements is an estimation of how much time you might wanna keep aside to do your placement properly. Um, so maybe 125 hours um, yeah, per placement is, I think that's a, probably a safe thing, but it's, yeah, it, it, it does change from placement to placement. Um, what else have we got here? Um, uh, Can you just ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's Adrian again. Um, 12, 12 weeks in a semester, someone also asked. Yep. 12 weeks a semester. Um, in terms of the, the, the delivery of the program are they with powerpoint displays and you meant to jot it down or what how's it conducted the actual seminars or the lectures how are they conducted it differs between class to class some is everyone sitting in a circle and navel gazing and talking about things and talking about their interactions with each other yeah. uh, some classes there will be a powerpoint presentation at the start of the class for maybe an hour and then there'll be two hours of practicing things yeah. or, dis or discussion or unpacking of things. Yeah. Um, and then, and then the study itself, you have to, there'll be readings allocated yeah. each week and yeah. you have to read the readings and watch the videos and yeah. prepare for the class. And you, most, you... most of the lecturers will upload the PowerPoint slides before the, before the, the presentation uh, and if not they'll upload it after it depends on if they want to they want you to come prepared or they want you to engage with things with yeah things. okay I, so you just go with the flow uh, but you 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 need to be responsible for your own learning so yeah yeah that you're cool. not going to be you're not going to be um, pre-reading yeah you're not going to be taught absolutely everything there is to know a lot of it you yeah. need to follow your own curiosity and then bring yeah. your questions to class which i then, do yeah 
So yeah. that's what we do. Well, I'm, 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 I like the um, program, the post-grad, but I'm thinking I probably won't be equipped that well. I probably can do it, but I think it'll be a mean ask. I think I'll go for the Bachelor of Psychology and Counselling. Like, no. I think, I think. Okay. I'm thinking, but I don't know. Just see how I go with the interview and see how they respond to me as well. No, no worries. Uh, were there any other questions that I missed? Sorry, Zola. Just before you go on, Adrian, remember if you're going to pursue the undergrad, you would need to apply through VTA and yeah. all your providers um, the information in regards to how to do that. Yeah, I'll go through VTAC. I'll look up, look it up in VTAC. Like, yeah, if you've got any problems, just, yeah, call us or email us. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Asha, did you have a question, Asha? Yes, thank you. Uh, what kind of support services do you have for students and how is the relationship between student and um, teacher or lecturer cultivated? Um, great question. So we've got... Uh, we've got um, Fiona who helps with academic writing. We've got librarians who uh, are always up for a chat and you can go into the library and chit chat with them and they'll direct you to books and videos and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, the lecturers have an open door policy. So you can always, um, I mean, we're very clear on uh, what we're offering along the way. And then you can always reach out to your lecturer if you, if you not sure about something the fact that it's such small classes like you I mean you know you you're getting up to like maybe 24 people in a class at most in the master's year you end up with maybe 10 people in a class 12 people in the class so what what that ends up happening with that is that you have lecturers accompanying your process and helping you through things and helping you um, kind of distinguish you know what's what's for you to work on and what's for your learning and how you can imp improve things and um, answer your questions so it's a personal relationship uh, you know a professional relationship about it but a but it's a, it's a personal one it's it's not a lecture hall with 400 students and that you can you know the bad side of that is that there's nowhere to hide you know there's nowhere to hide we know who you are and when you're in class you know if you're you know, if you're having a tough time, we'll likely notice and have a chat and going, what's happening for you and how can we better support you? Um, you know, so, um, but that, you know, I mean, that's that's the struggle that your clients will have. Your clients will always have a struggle between wanting to be seen and not wanting to be seen. And there's, we, we want both. We don't want to be seen because there's always stuff that we don't want people to see, but at the same time, there's something that's very gratifying about someone really recognizing who you are and ap appreciating um, what you bring uh, as a person and, and supporting you to do your best so mm -hmm. um, yeah so that's kind of and then each lecturer is different and you know part of what you, you're going to have to do is well how do we navigate the fact that some of our lecturers are very committed to one way of thinking about things and some of our lecturers are con committed to another way of thinking about things well how do I deal with that well I'm going to have to work it out I'm going to have to see where it all meets me and 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 do my own reading and critically think about things and work it out so and you know we we're not um invested in you religiously uh you know following following our passion because that, that, you know, the passion comes with having people that are passionate about what they do. And so you have to decipher for yourself, well, does this fit my value system? And if I'm rejecting it, that's okay. But I want to, you want to be able to go, well, what is it about it that's not sitting well for me? And how much is this is just my conditioning? How much is it things I need to think about in a fresh way? You know, that's, that's the... I know that's kind of a very vague question. You'll get a uh, very vague answer. You'll get a lot of those from us because we're yeah. very um, yeah. organic I, I, in how we work with things. <laughs> so like, no, I really love that. Band on that. Um, so you're, the lecturers here and the teaching staff are subject matter experts. Um, they're trained professionals in the field. Um, from a facilities perspective, you've got your kitchen parking in, breakout rooms, quiet rooms, prayer rooms, your library, 
but everything's online now as well. So, you know, your databases and so forth for students who may um, have additional needs um, and additional learning support needs. Um, and yeah, yeah, I didn't mention you. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't mention you. You're like Anne is. Uh, Anne is uh, supports uh, students with um, any kind of access issues and uh, like disability stuff and things like that. So Anne's um, job is to make sure that and also looks after international students because international students have to deal with a lot of extra stuff that um, might not be a given for other students. Yeah, Asha. Sorry, I cut you off, Anne. Oh, well, that's okay. I oh, no, no, you summed it up beautifully. Uh, <laughs> and you know, we've got peer support, um, mentoring, leadership programs. So we're really, um, and we're really growing. Um, we just got accredited um, and approved to offer the uh, masters of um, family and youth. Claudia, correct me. Do you remember? I always forget the full name. So we're really growing as well. 